Hmm. I'll bring him in and ask him if he's been here. Okay. Well, great. Welcome to uh, this week's uh, Zoom chat. I added him up. This is uh, chat number 97. Uh, I kept thinking, oh, I'll do uh, you know half a dozen of these and the virus will be done and uh, we'll be back to it. And now it's uh, number 97. And that doesn't wow. include the uh, couple weeks where we took off for things. So, uh, well, welcome. We're going to be uh, talking about the Chicago World's Fair. Let me just uh, go to mute here one second. If anybody has anything that's important, they can uh, unmute and jump uh, jump out there. But we just try to keep the barking dogs down to a minimum uh, until the male lady comes here and my dogs go off to uh, their usual crazy uh, craziness. So I've talked about the Chicago Fair before. Let me just uh, get over to the pictures that I want to use here. One second. And I will start with, uh, let's see, share a screen. We'll start with a shameless <coughs> plug. If uh, you haven't seen it, this is the uh, cover of the book I did on the uh, fair a number of years ago. And I really got interested in the fair when I bought some pictures that were supposed to be the Belgian village from the 64 World's Fair. And they turned out to be a totally different Belgian village because everybody was uh, wearing all antique type clothes, uh, straw hats and uh, different dresses. And it turned out to be the Belgian village of the 1933 World's Fair. So uh, it's a lot of fun putting the book together. But like in all these things, I, I, I always start them with, uh, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna have enough pictures for it. And then I get down into the, oh my goodness, I've got uh, too many. So I'm uh, gonna go through some of the pictures today that um, I don't think most of these made the book. Others have been recently restoring. Uh, in the book I mentioned, I call this the last black and white fair. I'm not the first person to call it that because uh, Kodachrome basically came out in 1935. There were some early color films people were experimenting with uh, at this point in time, but pretty much everything was black and white. And even the postcards in that that you get uh, that are in color are all hand colored artist interpretations of what the things uh, look like in color. So we're gonna see lots and lots of black and white today. Uh, this particular batch is a bunch of uh, restored negatives that I did and uh, we're up at the top of the Skyway Tower, which went across the uh, lagoon over there uh, to the other side of the fair. And I thought this was a really nice one to start with giving an idea of just how large a uh, operation this was. Just for history, for folks that don't know it, uh, Chicago had had a huge fair in 1898. Uh, businessmen started thinking, hey, let's do another one. Uh, to uh, celebrate the city's anniversary, the 100 years of its founding. Politicians said, no, 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 we were not interested in doing it. It's not gonna work out. There's no land for it anyway. So the uh, businessmen put together a, a plan that they were gonna do it without needing any government money. And if you're not gonna pay us uh, any money, then you don't have any say if we're, there, we're gonna do it or not. So uh, it turned out to be quite successful. Uh, the first year actually lost some money and we'll talk more about that as we go through it, but they brought it back for a second season and turned a very nice, healthy profit on it. Mentioned land, that there was no land for it. Well, they didn't let that get in the way. Uh, formerly, uh, the shoreline of Chicago is pretty much where these roads are. And they just got a lot of dirt and rocks and filled out everything in here and expanded the shoreline to build the, uh, the fair. Mentioned the uh, Belgian village uh, before they had gone over to Belgium, took plaster molds of actual buildings over in Belgium, uh, recreated the village. Uh, the same molds were put in storage afterwards and reused for the 1964 New York Fair. The Belgian village was an amazing hit. A uh, huge uh, number of people went to it. And in the 34 season, uh, they tore down a lot of the things that were not successful in 1933 and started building all sorts of international villages because there was a tremendous interest by the public in seeing the world without having to get on an airplane and actually go over there. Down below, you can see the very bottom, a century of progress, it's written down there. This was not a souvenir picture that was uh, bought um, and, uh, you know, um, with that on there. It was very popular at that point in time to be able to go to a place and have a, uh, 
graphic overlay put on your picture to uh, tell you what the title was. So there were places that you could come out, get your roll of film exposed, and then they would go off and print it with this uh, right on there. So th this is a vintage print. There are also uh, some places that did very nice fancy borders. Um, you know, so your picture would be there with this scroll work. And uh, I think we'll see some of those coming up later on. Uh, very elaborate uh, titles that were on there. So this gentleman is out there buying a flower. She's happily pinning on uh, the lapel. But just like New York, cobblestone streets and uh, you know stained glass pane windows, uh, they, they went to a lot of effort to do it. Folks having a nice meal at the fair. In the background, you can see the tower of the Belgian village. I'm not quite sure which restaurant they're eating in here. Folks getting down ready for a show. We can see it looks like a mountain goat or something jumping up on top of something there. There again, all sorts of villages. Uh, there was a, a, a Swiss village. There was a, a Oriental village. There was the um, a village of, um, uh, not a village, it was the, uh, oh, uh, George Washington's home. Um, oh, what is it? Um, Anybody remember George Washington, the name of George Washington's home out there outside of Virginia? Mount, Mount Vernon. Vernon. Mount Vernon. As soon as I heard Mount, I knew it. Uh, it. We'll see more of those. You could go out here and you could see bears in a bear pit. Uh, the big sign there on the side warning you don't go down in it. Out to the Belgian village again. And again, these were all kind of randomly stuck in an envelope and uh, restored in no particular order. Looking across the border, uh, bridgeway going over from a parking lot over to one of the entrances of the fair. Um, boundary wall going around it uh, didn't make it so easy to get up over the wall. They didn't put a fence in. What was interesting is the Belgian village here had some elements not seen in New York, including this ruined building of a wall, uh, a gateway into a walled city. So while the New York fair used uh, a lot of the molds, they didn't use all the molds that were saved from the fair. Tremendous amount of effort put into the, into the buildings. I'm just hopping through the village here. And again, we wouldn't know that we're sitting here in uh, Chicago, just like New York. Uh, the area was pretty flat. They built the hills and uh, basically just uh, man-made mountains and steps and uh, plaster casts of the buildings. On, uh, I think this was pretty much wooden framework. New York used more steel framework for some of the towers. I don't recall if Chicago used wood or steel. Again, the bell tower, exactly what you would see in New York. And we'll continue to hop around. I don't think we had Joey here today, but if he did, we're at Sinclair Dino Land. The dinosaurs uh, were rougher, cruder than they uh, showed up in New York. So you can see how this particular guy looks rather lumpy. Uh, the T-Rex, I think we'll see him is even lumpier. But the, they had some movement. Uh, his head would move back and forth. They had speakers uh, down below where a narrator uh, described what was going on uh, with the dinosaurs. And they also had recreations of the, uh, uh, what they thought the dinosaurs might have sounded like at that point in time. Very popular uh, exhibit. There was another exhibit of uh, Earth a million years ago and more dinosaurs there. Some of their dinosaurs were a little different than the Sinclair dinosaurs. And, that's because all we can do today is kind of guess what they look like. We have the, uh, you know, the skeletons, of course, to go with. But you know, uh, for all we know, these guys are bright, bright green and bright purple. You know, anything that people come up with for their coloring is, uh, you know, conjecture. In the background, you can see a concert hall over there. Big crowd, uh, just like we've seen for uh, the 39 New York and other fairs. People dress very formally. It's very, very rare that you'll see a man without a hat in some of these shows. Uh, and then down below, you can see here, even a lot of the, the boys wore hats. Uh, and they're also wearing uh, uh, different type of clothes and that sort of thing, but uh, everybody's all dressed up. Uh, in the background, you can see a sign, welcome Al Smith. Al, I believe was the governor of New York at the time and he had come out here to, uh, to visit. 
here is again the, the world a million years ago and some of their examples of dinosaurs and gorillas and things that you can go and see inside. More of the Sinclair dinosaurs, the T-Rex is uh, squaring uh, off here for a battle with a Triceratops, just like in New York. One of the Swiss villages. And what I really like about these old pictures, you can get um, amazing amount of detail. So we can see a sign up here. We can start zooming in on it and you can make out, you know, exactly what the name of, of it is, the whole motif of the, uh, the artwork and everything. So uh, today everybody's taking pictures in their cell phones. Most of them, as I've mentioned before in prior talks are probably gonna be lost to time. But here's a 90 year old picture and it's held up uh, very, very well. Outside we have uh, the Japan Pavilion. Off to the right, we had the temple uh, that was built uh, by a, a private collector, an exact uh, reproduction of a temple overseas brought here to, uh, to Chicago. They would do uh, parades out here. This was the uh, Chinese dragon, and uh, they would use it as a lure to get people to come back to the Chinese village, which you had to go and pay money to go see. So the sign here is that the dragon was courtesy of Mr. Charles Young and his Chinese temple downtown Chicago. But they would march through the grounds, get everybody in a Pied Piper sort of um, uh, procession, go back to the uh, uh, Chinese village. And then if you wanted to come and see the rest of it, it was 25 cents. More of the village. Uh oh, if these guys aren't wearing hats, we better get the hat police on after them. There's always uh, always some uh, people out to cause trouble. Chinese performers, again, they would march through the grounds uh, about twice a day, do a, a very popular dance. Down below, another one of the uh, motifs you could get printed onto your vintage pictures. This is the Hall of Science, a uh, very popular area here. You had all the uh, chairs out down below. They did a lot of concerts and uh, uh, musical groups, that sort of thing. But here in the background, this uh, display here was a uh, path that they decided a 100 years ago, what was going on in the solar system. Kind of ties it today with everybody getting a kick out of the James Webb telescope pictures we're seeing from NASA. They timed uh, a, a gimmick to open up the fair where a light that had left the star Arcturus exactly 100 years ago would come in through a telescope, hit a photoelectric cell, be relayed across a, a number of devices, come to Chicago and amazingly turn on all the lights of the fair. And that particular board was uh, displaying the route that the uh, path took from the observatory to the fair when they lit it all up in a massive ceremony. This is called the Avenue of the Flags. It was the main drag that went through the fairgrounds. The uh, flags were just like in New York, uh, where they just put up a bunch of colored flags without any particular design. Uh, there were flags of the nations outside their particular pavilions, but this particular one was just colored banners for uh, basically eye candy. Uh, they found out Chicago being called the Windy City for a particular reason, because it's real windy, they had a constant issue with these four flags getting shredded. So I've got some pictures of half flags, shredded flags, no flags, and they're just uh, reproducing them. Down below uh, the items with the discs are the street lights for this particular area of the fair. In the background, the big tower is the Skyway, which would go across the lagoon. Very, very late addition to the fair. The fair uh, was supposed to have a giant water tower as its central structure, uh, basically its version of the Eiffel Tower or the Unisphere, uh, they decided that they just could not build a tower economically. So for a while, it looked like it was not gonna be any uh, particular eye-catching long distance element to the fair. But a uh, outside developer said, hey, I'd like to build this uh, tower ride, uh, take people across on these uh, gondolas. So it never was an official theme structure, but it, uh, it was the unofficial theme structure built by an outside company, just like the Space Needle was built uh, for the um, Seattle World's Fair. This is the Federal Pavilion. Uh, we have, uh, again, three towers here. 
symbolically representing the three uh, parts of the United States government, uh, the executive branch, the judicial, and the uh, legislative branch. Uh, massive building and uh, built, uh, <clears throat> again, with all federal money and uh, displays of what your taxpayer dollars were doing for you. This particular role, the guy or gal really enjoyed the, uh, the village. For the avenue of the flags, down below, way in the background, you can see the uh, Adler at, uh, uh, Planetarium, which had predated the uh, uh, fair. It's still there today. You can go back to Chicago. It's a great way to uh, get yourself uh, oriented to where the site is. Bill? Yeah. Um, I think maybe that's the aquarium. Oh, you're right. It's the aquarium in the background. Yeah, the, the, uh, the different dome for the uh, planetarium. Thank you, Wayne. Mm -hmm. So here's the uh, tower for the sky ride, and it's going across. And up above, we have the Goodyear Blimp. They had at least one, I think maybe two of them. I think it's pretty, I think it's two of them were going in and out, uh, giving rides to the fair. The gondolas went uh, all the way across, and they were done with a very uh, Buck Rogers type of design with it was actually uh, a thing in the background that could spit out smoke and everything to make it look like you were flying across there. You can also take the ride all the way up to the top and get a, a nice view of the fairgrounds. So that first view we had seen in the uh, very beginning of the fair was taken from one of the two towers. In the book, I have a picture of a guy who's standing up at the top of the uh, tower. And I absolutely love the caption that he's written on uh, the back of his photo. From uh, 90 years ago, as close to heaven as I'm likely to get. Mm -hmm. And below the Raskeller, this was at the old Heidelberg Inn. Big, uh, big time. Again, people dressed up in native costumes from different countries, as we've seen in other fairs, lots and lots of native days. And they were very popular in Chicago. Chicago had all sorts of immigrants that were living over there. And this was a great chance for them to come in, party, and uh, recreate things from the, the old country. More of the dinosaurs. This poor guy looks awfully lumpy. I don't know, skin and bones or something. But uh, again, he actually moved his head back and forth. There are movies of him in, in action. One of the other villages, I believe this was the Irish village. And again, Old pictures, uh, this picture was about uh, three by five inches, but with a good scanner, you can start picking up uh, a lot of details in the signs. So we can see that Sinclair motor oil, I don't know how it's older than the dinosaurs because supposedly the oil has come from decomposed dinosaurs, but you can uh, get a tremendous amount of detail you can pull out of these. Chinese dancer. This one here is kind of interesting. Um, it's a, a tavern. You can see signs here for the grill and restaurant and uh, that sort of thing. But if we look, there's two little people. There's one in a uh, very strange sort of outfit with a round flat hat there and another one off to the side. This was in an area where midget villages were a uh, draw at uh, uh, World's Fairs. And this is inside that particular area. So the fellow in the uniform off to the right is a, a member of the police department for this particular miniature village. And then uh, the fellow off to the left is just one of the other residents uh, going through it. And a lot of gardens uh, here on display. Uh, awful lot of the companies that uh, would do gardening and try to convince people that you could put these plants or structures in your yard, uh, build sample gardens out there. So some of them had uh, uh, rose gardens, others had uh, you know winter type gardens, some brought in palm trees and things like that for the, uh, the, the summer. But uh, some of the artifacts built for these gardens were re uh, planted to a nursery that you can go still visit them today. So it's kind of interesting that some of the artifacts and things have survived. This is the California Hacienda. The background is a fake mountain uh, to give you the impression that you're out in California, but big uh, pond outside with water lilies, which I don't particularly associate with California where we are, uh, I don't see much of this. But inside was uh, displays of California tourism and uh, 
a little bit about California industry, but mostly about tourism and why you'd like to come out here and visit us. Again, more of the Hall of Science. If I zoom in here, you can see more of the display here, how Western Union was transmitting uh, with, along with GE and Westinghouse. GE and Westinghouse both combined to do the lighting for the fair. In the book, I mentioned uh, how they really went way out of their way for uh, things that were new at the time, uh, different fluorescent lights, neon lights, uh, carbon lighting, all sorts of different things. So the two deadly rival companies joined up in a uh, uh, partnership to uh, really put electric lighting on the map for this thing. And then down below, again, you can see how the um, uh, signal followed from observatory to observatory to observatory, all as Western Union uh, transmitted the signal to open the fair. More of the garden area out there, uh, big birdhouse here in the center of it. Uh, normally, if a picture is at an angle like this, I would straighten it out so it doesn't look like the birds are all going to fall out of the birdhouse. But then, because they had the title printed on the bottom of the picture, it makes that look weird, so I've uh, left them tilted off to the side. We're going to see some uh, pictures of the lake, which looks like the water would be all running off screen because they were really at an angle. Again, you could come out here, tour the gardens. Uh, you could pick up flyers and uh, see what you'd like to order back home, or you could go, go to a kiosk, uh, say, I'd like to get a uh, uh, you know, copy of this, that, and that, and they would take the plants and mail them right to your house. In the center, we can see here folks getting rides. This was, uh, again, very popular. Most of the fairs at this point in time to have a, a rickshaw type device. Sometimes they were uh, pedaled, sometimes they were pulled. But uh, if you had money, you could go off and get somebody to give you a guided tour of the, uh, the fair. And there's a whole bunch of these uh, ladies out getting pulled around. And it looks like they're taking a break because they're enjoying the pictures of the flowers. Another view of the California Hacienda, the Skyway Tower up behind it. And here is the other type of tram car or ride that you can get around. Those were in rickshaws being pulled around. Those were one person uh, vehicles. These took two at a time and you got a sunscreen over your head and somebody pushed you around the, uh, the World's Fair in the, uh, the height of decadence, right? Back to the Belgian village, a dog park. You can see the little blurry down here with two dogs, and they would uh, wander around with jugs of milk, uh, just done exactly like they did in uh, the real days in Belgium. This is interesting. Uh, again, not in any particular order of times. This is during the construction of the fair, and you can see the lagoon here is frozen over uh, ice out in the middle. During the time the fair was open, uh, as a way to raise money, they sold tickets and you could come in and tour the fairgrounds, uh, go around, take pictures, go uh, back home, tell everybody how uh, amazing it was. They uh, uh, let you come in. Uh, they, they, if the buildings were done, but the exhibits weren't in, you could wander the empty buildings. When some of the buildings were not done, you got to wander the grounds. But here's the federal complex going up in the background. Uh, this fellow is checking the film in his own camera. But uh, it was a great way to raise some money. Uh, but the biggest thing was to get publicity did to it. They did this later, uh, again, for the uh, uh, Golden Gate International Exposition in uh, San Francisco in 39. They did it for the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Uh, if they had done it for the 64 World's Fair, I would have been spending all my allowance to, to go and visit the fair during its construction. But uh, by that point in time, people realized that uh, the construction sites and people did not always mix safely. So they, it's not something that they do anymore. The last one I remember them doing, it was uh, Seattle, 1962. Hey, Bill. Actually, yeah. They actually did it at Expo 2020, but that's because it was delayed. Yes, that's right. Because of so the it pandemic. was actually completed, just sitting there. And I, I don't think they let people into the buildings, but they were allowed to tour the grounds. The, the grounds, yeah. I know they did it for Seattle that you can come out there and, and tour the grounds. And there wasn't even a charge in Seattle. You just came and walked around and looked around. And it's kind of amazing that people did it back then. So again, all this land they're standing on is man-made. All these rocks, uh, you know, uh, stuff dumped out there. 
Uh, in this particular case, it's really a little too hard to see in this picture, but uh, there's a bunch of seaplanes. We're going to see them coming into other shots. A, uh, the Italians scored a uh, real international aviation coup by flying from Italy over to the United States with a bunch of seaplanes, and we're going to see them out uh, on the water. And here is the seaplanes overhead. So they're uh, making a big ceremonial pass over the city. The Goodyear blimp is off to the, uh, the side, uh, taking tours. We're going to see more of the blimp. But this was an amazing thing to think that you could fly an armada of airplanes all the way across the ocean. Of course, 1933, it was a great idea. It uh, wasn't so great in uh, just a couple of years later when bombers were coming across oceans and dropping uh, things there. But this was a, a huge, huge thing for the uh, Italian Air Force that they were able to pull this off. Swiss Village. Again, lots of uh, uh, these buildings were built overseas uh, using uh, local materials and artistry and then taken apart, put in the crates, brought over here. The uh, local artisans would come back over to the United States, put it together, and uh, the buildings would uh, be on display. Outside the Belgian village. Again, this building here in the city hall, you get they had a picture in 1964 in New York, it's going to look identical. And they're out there doing a dance, they're in their wooden shoes, and all the, the guys are down, it looks like they're all proposing to the, the young ladies. Again, this is when I first bought pictures, what I thought was the 64 World's Fair, and I started looking at it, and everybody's wearing these, you know, the, the straw hats and things like that. It's like, what's going on here? I had never heard really any details of the 33 Fair. When I started doing it, there was not a lot available on the internet, which is, uh, you know, still in the sort of its infancy at that point in time. But I found a, a map of the Belgian village online somebody had taken out of a guidebook and I said my goodness that's the same same village so uh, it was kind of amazing for me to spot as I mentioned the kids would dress up I don't know if you dressed up in an outfit like this today uh, what would happen to you you'd probably get the, the Jesus kicked out of you but he's all dressed up tie and everything her nice hilly street there church in the background Okay, up at the top here, uh, and again, uh, Wayne mentioned uh, rightly the aquarium. Down below here at the park, uh, one of the uh, uh, bell, uh, band shells built out here. Museum off to the left side. This again is up at the top of the uh, tower. Most of the shots people took are uh, looking towards the fairgrounds, but this was a nice view looking towards downtown. We can also see in 1933, they had not uh, yet licked smog. Uh, back then you had all the steam burning locomotives, big train yards going right through here, but all the buildings had their own uh, uh, power plants, incinerators, uh, all sorts of things that uh, made a mess. There's a really neat railroad that ran underneath Chicago. If you ever go online and look for it, it it's really interesting. A lot of the buildings would burn fuel and then dump the ashes down into the basement and miniature train cars would come around and uh, haul away the, uh, the ashes and take them out. But uh, everybody just burned whatever they burned at the time, probably a lot of coal and it made the air really messy. The old Heidelberg Inn, uh, very, very popular, uh, uh, serving beer out there and uh, it was uh, Great spot to go from what the guidebook says to get your plate of German food in that. Avenue of the Flags again. More Mr. Lumpy. But the fair did not do in 1933 the projected number of people, not because it wasn't successful, it's because the projections were insane. I mean, if they had gotten the crowds that they thought they were going to get for 1933, I don't know where everybody would have fit in. But you can see that this is pretty, pretty uh, busy on this particular day. Um, and uh, I forget what the initial projected numbers were and what they came in to be, but uh, they didn't hit the number. But so as a result, they lost money. 
but they came to the decision that, hey, we've already built this thing. We've already put uh, all the streets in. Well, first of all, we dumped all that rock and dirt into the, uh, the, the lake. But we put all the streets in, the power lines, the gas lines, the water lines, the sewer lines. So we've already spent 90% of what it would cost to build a fair. It's already here. Why don't we do a second year? And that's what they did. And uh, they ended up uh, turning out, I think it was $160,000 profit of the second year, which is $160,000 in uh, 1934 was a good amount of money. They actually talked about going and uh, opening up for, again for another year. And the people in charge said, no, let's not push our luck. Let's, uh, let's turn it down. This is one of the villages, Mary. Bill, Bill yeah. sorry, quick, quick question. So if you're putting on a World's Fair or Expo and there's the international group that uh, heads all that, if you want to go another year, you have to get permission, correct? Uh, actually, I think in this particular case, I don't know if they even bothered to, uh, to do it. Uh, I don't know if they're going to uh, un, uh, what you call it, un, uh, unendorse you or not. I'm not sure if they went off and applied to them or not, uh, but I know, for example, New York for the 1940 season did not bother, stuff like that. So um, I, I think most people just do it. And then there, there's only been a couple that have gone, you know, uh, later, uh, you know, for, for extra seasons. But I don't know what their existing rules quite are. These are interesting to look at. This is Mary England, another one of the villages. I just restored this one early this week. And again, I, I love as I'm diving into these things just to get the, uh, the details. So what do we have here for Mary England? What would your souvenir be that you get in Mary England? Uh, you could get live turtles for a quarter. <laughs> why, why a live turtle would be a, su a souvenir of England is uh, beyond me, but uh, this was late in the season. You can see that the souvenirs are reduced uh, to 15 to 25 percent. Uh, over here, probably more traditional English uh, souvenirs. People dress up. She's here in a heavy uh, fur coat. Um, again, you could come. This is again more what I would imagine you get in England. You get some uh, fine, you know, British uh, lace and that sort of stuff. But uh, over here, uh, they had an exhibit of Egyptian exhibit. And you say, okay, why uh, would there be an Egyptian exhibit in Mary England? Well, England had brought back so many things for the uh, British Museum that came out of Egyptian tombs and that, that there was big, heavy interest in it. And they had some displays over here. Another one I just finished doing, we zoom in on the sign here. It's uh, the uh, Raskeller for the old Heidelberg Inn. And again, if we notice all the signs say the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, because it had been planned for just the one year. So in later years, they would change the signage for 1934. But uh, uh, again, I, I just love the details which you can pull out of these pictures. A little less crowded than the other day we've seen of the old Heidelberg Inn. This was downtown during the construction phase. Uh, this is one of the actual Cars used for the sky ride. They uh, brought it down here uh, to downtown. There's a, a sign off the, to the left. The man is uh, watching it, uh, reading it. But this is the build up interest that you can come in and get a ride on the Skyway car uh, during the fair. Uh, the nose of it's off to the left. The rocket engines, you can see the fin sticking out to the right. During the fair, these were all. Uh, signed with uh, big names of characters from the Amos and Andy uh, radio show, which sponsored the ride. So uh, you can see the Amos car, the Andy car, the brother Crawford car, other ones that were uh, uh, characters of the, uh, the, uh, the radio show. And by now we all know where this is. Another construction photo going on here. There's a little guard gate off to the uh, left, uh, the Skyway Tower there. And uh, this is the Hall of Science, the back side of it. Again, 1833, founding of Chicago. So this is the 100th anniversary. Here I mentioned uh, water is going to run off to the side. The uh, seaplanes that we saw going over before have uh, landed. There is uh, the one smack in the center, another one off to the side here. A motor launch uh, taking people out for uh, tours of the uh, area. But uh, it was a huge, huge win for uh, Italian aviation. So that's the end of that group of pictures.
And let me go and grab the next batch here. And I mentioned in the, uh, before you can get ornate uh, pictures frames on it. So uh, you would take your picture. I've not yet uh, restored all these. Uh, so we're going to see some splotches and some uh, uh, um, dirt and stuff on them. But I think they, they gave some nice uh, views here. Uh, the tower, two of the, the tour, uh, the, the gondola is going back and forth to it. Uh, down below, a boat. You could take boat rides around the, uh, the lagoon and a number of different type of boats. Um, the U.S. Pavilion, again, the uh, original photographer was kind enough to add uh, titles and descriptions to a number of these. One or two cases, they didn't quite get them right, but happily, they, they got most of them. Chrysler had an amazingly large presence at the uh, fair. Uh, Chrysler never quite making it to the top of the uh, heap for uh, the car company. But uh, Ford sat at the 33 fair. You had General Motors off to the right. You can just see their tower sticking up. And Chrysler here off, off to the side. The building had this large glass facade, which had a showroom inside of all the Chrysler cars uh, up in uh, the showroom and inside uh, displays about how they were made and, and that sort of thing. Just like General Motors, you could go over and uh, uh, order a car. At General Motors, they would actually make a car uh, out in front of you. So, uh, but this was a very, very popular attraction. Ford came back for the 34 season in style. They did a big pavilion, the Ford Rotunda which was a huge success and later moved uh, to Detroit, sadly burned down in a fire during a renovation. They also had a, uh, the Ford Industrial Barn showing you how uh, they, they could do all sorts of things with uh, machinery and soybeans and how Ford was convinced soybeans are gonna be the crop of the future. And uh, he was really big on how you could do all that with that. They also had a uh, road that they would ride around on uh, cobblestone roads, log roads, dirt roads to show you just how well a Ford uh, suspension would work. And they also had a bandstand to entertain people. So they really came out in, uh, in style. This is the court of the states. Not every state was there, but for the ones that did, you got a, uh, uh, everybody's uh, uh, section here in the front was of the same size, the uniform uh, size. So you have a big state like California, got a, uh, a section here. A uh, state that didn't have quite as much money would get the same thing. Now behind it, the buildings could go further out. So you'd have uh, more uh, space. But we saw the Hacienda before uh, for California I mentioned that was big on tourism. This was more on the California government uh, exhibits and uh, the things of uh, why you'd come out to build your business out in California. We can see Texas here, that sort of thing. Uh, lake view in the background, got a nice uh, uh, breeze that came through for all the concerts and shows that were held out here. The Haveline thermometer uh, would tell you just how hot it was at the fair that particular day. Just reading that London today is supposed to hit 104 this weekend. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how hot it got in Chicago back at this point in time, but um, it was probably not as hot then as it is now, but a giant thermometer. Furry's eye view of the fair, again, taken from one of the towers. This is looking down along in the opposite direction of most of them. Um, you can see uh, the other one was taken from the other tower. This is on this side. Uh, the other tower went over here looking down that we saw. Mentioned before, the two electric companies really went out of their way to uh, light this fair up. Uh, tremendous displays of light at night that could be seen for quite a distance. Electric pavilion, uh, the fountain in front of it, um, side all the sorts of things on how electricity was going to make uh, your light even better. And again, it's hard to think 90 years ago, a lot of people, electricity was, uh, you know, still uh, not as common as we might take it for today in, in uh, ways of our lives. Certain things like electric air conditioning for, for one. Looking down towards Chrysler, uh, outside roadway here. Here goes one of the Italian planes flying by General Motors Pavilion. General Motors is amazingly large uh, exhibited here. I mean, they were really just projecting screen dominance 
uh, you know, the, uh, American industry was great, but General Motors was the king of American industry if, if you listen to them. Lagoon out here, again, initially in the planning, there was going to be a very large tower with water cascading down, giant uh, fountains. They decided that the uh, engineering cost of doing it was going to be uh, uh, too, uh, too hard to do. And then also the water, uh, the only way they could do it economically was to coat it in gypsum, not in concrete. And when they built models of it to test it, uh, they realized that the water would wash the gypsum away. So the, the uh, plant theme structure never got built. The Golden Temple of Jehol, as I mentioned, this was built by a private individual. He went overseas to an actual temple, had it copied uh, uh, board by board, stone by stone, brought here and put on display. It was later uh, taken apart, put into storage, rebuilt for the uh, 1939 World's Fair. It has since been taken apart, put into storage, and evidently it's caught up in controversy that uh, they wanted to restore it, but people figure it's a Western copy of an Eastern build, a religious building, and it's sort of sacrilegious, so it's still sitting in storage at a university. Another view of the village. Looking across the lagoon towards the uh, federal pavilion, again, you can see you can take a boat here and take uh, uh, go all the way over here to the uh, uh, dock that was in front of the federal pavilion. Most people did not take the, the boat because the boat charged money and it was a perfectly free bridge to walk around. So the boat concessions did okay, but they didn't do uh, really, really well. They didn't make as much money as they, uh, they thought. You could get an airplane ride to the fairgrounds. So it was a seaplane dock we'll see uh, here at the uh, uh, on the pictures, and they would take you in a quick ride that went around the uh, fairground. Unfortunately, they did have a, a crash in one of the planes that kind of put a damper on it. Here you can see large parking lots. Uh, they were trying to encourage most people to come by bus or by train, but uh, the uh, private uh, ownership of automobiles was taking off, so they put out the uh, giant parking lots out there. This was a really interesting uh, piece of engineering uh, architecture. This is the Hall of Travel and Transportation. And we see those towers uh, off to the side. They were basically on the outside of the building, holding up the roof by the cables that are suspended between them. So this meant the entire building inside was one giant empty amount of exhibit space. Uh, this was very new and daring at the time to have a uh, suspended ceiling design that held everything up there. And it got a lot of uh, critical acclaim from architects and uh, uh, building uh, people for the, the time. This was the other part of the transportation pavilion. So you had this building, the main uh, draw going in. Uh, you can see down here entrance. And this was an exhibit hall off to the side with a large scale exhibits inside. Again, this was built to hold up the roof by doing these uh, pillars that went across and the buildings were held up without a lot of pillars inside. So two different ways to build tremendous exhibit spaces without internal structures. Mayan temple out here, we'll see more of that as we come by. They uh, had intended to recreate the entire temple. The money uh, ran out, so they ended up doing about 20% of it, but it was still pretty impressive. Another view of the Court of the States. Again, looking down from the, the tower uh, going across it. They had a lot of these statues. Uh, again, they were done. We'll zoom in on this. Some of these were done in plaster, so they did not survive. A couple of them were done in aluminum because it was a new cutting age uh, uh, medium that they, uh, people were doing sculptures in. You can see there's still blotches and stuff. I've not gone around to restoring it. But when I do, all these dirt and everything will be uh, taken out. Great view of the Hall of Science and the, uh, the gondola ride. The gondola worked out very successfully. There was a lot of concern with the wind from Chicago, the ability for this thing to derail itself. And God forbid it had derailed itself with people stuck halfway across. They had some minor issues, particularly in the beginning. As you can imagine, working the bugs out of anything. 
but it turned out that they had really engineered it well. The cable stayed on track and they had no major uh, problems during the time of the fair. Another night view. More of the dinosaurs. We're going to cross over at the uh, electric area. General Motors, again, General Motors being the brand name, but then they had all the uh, particular uh, type of cars, so you could get a General Motors truck, a Cadillac, uh, the uh, get a LaSalle. I don't think uh, they've put many LaSalles on sales in recent years. Double exposure here. This was Admiral Byrd. Uh, he had successfully taken a ship down to Antarctica, brought it up here to uh, uh, the fair. There were a number of interesting vessels. You could come on board the ship again for an admission and see the conditions that people lived on when they toured over to uh, Antarctica. The neatest exhibit was a World War I submarine that a fellow bought from the government surplus. The uh, United States government sold it for scrap. Uh, in the contract, it did not specify it had to be scrapped. So he kept it as his own personal World War I submarine and would sail it around uh, different places and charge people a quarter to come on board. Uh, brought it here to Chicago, was there for the two years of the fair. A lot of people wanted to go on board a submarine. And uh, after the fair, he continued to do it. If you were somewhere on a you know, a lake or a river that you could get to, he would sail his submarine up to dock it. World War II came along and people started reporting that there were U-boats going up and down the Great Lakes. And he was very concerned that the United States Navy was going to sink his World War I submarine. So he came to an agreement with the Navy. He would sell them the submarine, which they were glad to get because they were tired of chasing it. Uh, and they started using it for uh, tr a training ship. Unfortunately, it's down off of uh, it's sunk in a, uh, a training exercise uh, on their uh, uh, Rhode Island. I think it's Rhode Island. Uh, anyway, it's down and it's, it's, it's still there today in about 125 feet of water. But the, I, I, you know, for those of us that worked on submarines, the thought of owning your own submarine is, to, to me at least, it's, it's mind-boggling. Again, the gardens were built by all sorts of different gardens. So this guy did an alpine garden. We can zoom in a bit here and see. Done by these three different nurseries, the Wayside Gardens, Klaus Brothers, and the Fun Bell Nursery. A number of these companies are still in existence. And uh, but this was the whole idea. You can come in and we would build this in your yard for you with waterfalls and rocks and everything. Or you could just buy the plants and take them home. Old Mexico, they were having a, a big display here, uh, the log rollers wedding. I mean, you don't think about log rollers being particularly associated with Mexico, but we'll zoom in on the sign here. Uh, it was, I think the date here looks like August 25th. It was a log rolling display and they didn't quite have the space for a giant wedding. So they uh, got into it with Mexico and you could come out here and uh, uh, take the tour of Mexico and you could for money, you could go and pay to be at somebody's wedding. Indian Trading Post, they actually, I think we're going to see some of the, uh, the teepees that people lived on. Uh, again, sort of things you wouldn't do in a fair today. But uh, Indians, Native Americans from different tribes came in, lived on the fairgrounds. And the trading post here, they would uh, offer uh, blankets, jewelry, other things that they, they had uh, made. And they were constantly making them um, for sale during the time here. But the tribes back home were also turning out, uh, you know, uh, huge quantities of stuff, more than the people on display at the fair could make. So it was a good source of income for the uh, Indians during that point in time. This was an interesting one to come across because we knew at Disney that Disney had an exhibit at the fair, but it was trying to figure out exactly where it was and what it did. So if you look here, animated movie cartoons in the making, and that's what they had done, was they had taken uh, a, a film, which unfortunately Disney cannot find right now, but showing, here's how we're making movies, and we have an artist here uh, you know, doing sketches and things along that line. This became very popular. Uh, you can see up above they have you know, uh, Al Jolson and Eddie Cantor and other uh, cutouts, that sort of thing. But the fair closed in 1933, and they took the uh, display, particularly the Disney display, and moved it to a large Chicago department store. 
so in between the seasons of the fair, uh, that you could still see how Disney cartoons were being made. And uh, this was a, a great one that we were able to nail down exactly where the Disney exhibit was for the, for the fair. So that's the end of that roll of film. Let me go to the last batch that we have here for the day. We're gonna go into the 1934 season of the fair. Uh, again, this is a, uh, uh, an album uh, embossed cover that I just took a scan of. Uh, most of the material uh, does say 33 on it. Some of the souvenir items do say 34, but in most cases, the uh, stuff was still being sold in 34 with the 33 logo on it, because it was things they had left over from 33 or they already had the dies and everything made. And we don't know how successful 34 is going to be, so let's not uh, sell an awful lot of it. So this is the transportation pavilion of the, the, the uh, building that I mentioned earlier. Off to the left is a, a glass tower, which is kind of interesting. It's a uh, Crosley Automobiles, and it was a giant conveyor belt that they would show their cars down at ground level, but it would take it and lift it up. And uh, they're trying to use it today for CarMax and some others that you have uh, car uh, uh, dealers that use uh, giant conveyor belts. Uh, I've got a better picture of it in the book, another shameless plug. Uh, this is the uh, entrance to the transportation building. It's cut off at the bottom of this weird angle because the person that took the picture took it at that much of an angle and I, I've straightened it out. What we wouldn't give to go back and uh, do a little shopping at the, uh, uh, the stand here, the souvenir stand. Again, Chrysler, we're going to see some of Ford coming up, this being the 34 season. But Chrysler had a very large presence. Looking across the lagoon here, different displays that we would hear. This is all the electrical group. If we zoom right in here in the center, you can see an exhibit honoring Thomas A. Edison. So again, we had uh, all sorts of stuff here on uh, his life. But GE was here, Westinghouse was here, everybody that made light bulbs doing anything was out here, or the Edison Pavilion there. The Electric Pavilion, uh, this is called the Electrical Group. Uh, this is the big fountain going off there. Base of the fountain. At night, the fountain particularly nice. All these pillars here were illuminated with a combination of neon and incandescent lights. The Hall of Science Tower. Some of these pavilions, uh, they did not end up with enough space that they would actually, I think this had three floors uh, of it and they only ever used two floors during the fair because they couldn't get enough exhibitors for the third floor, but it looked pretty neat. I don't think anything was actually on display up in the tower. Hall of Science here, um, this is taken out from the lagoon. Out here you could come out and rent your own boat and you could go paddling around out in the paddle boats uh, out here in the, the water. The Havoline thermometer, uh, again, the land of the world a million years ago with the uh, beast out here up on the roof drawing you in. The Havoline thermometer looked really neat, but it was not a giant thing of mercury. It was uh, basically somebody would look at a real thermometer down below and then mechanically adjust how high the uh, indicator went up uh, that particular day. This is uh, a and If you live back east, you might remember uh, the a and supermarket chain. We had one of those in my town. Uh, they had a uh, uh, display here where uh, they, they did musical performances under this uh, awning here. And uh, very popular, people would come in and listen. A lot of the entertainment at the fair was free. And it really got people uh, to come in. You, you spent your money to come in and uh, there was an awful lot that you could do inside for uh, very little uh, or no cost. So a and huge supermarket chain, no longer with us. It shows, again, I haven't restored all these, but this shows how the uh, pictures looked in the album. So you can see that I mentioned before, they uh, kind of, uh, well, I took it at a bit of an angle, so we're going to flip through these. I've left these in here just to remind myself of what I'm looking at as I restore them. But uh, So we'll get through the pages, and then we'll get into the uh, close-ups of the individual pictures themselves. We'll just hop through these real quick. 
There's the planetarium, the one I misidentified uh, earlier, the Adler Planetarium. Fields Museum still being there in the Shed Aquarium. We'll see, let me zip through these real quick. Okay, so we're now we're into the actual pictures themselves. I have to go through and work on these more to uh, work on the uh, contrast and brightness, uh, but the US Federal Pavilion, Nice view here. Again, uh, boat rides that you can take over here to it. Uh, lots of gardens and uh, areas you can get the uh, meals. The Golden Temple, again, sadly sitting in crates in some warehouse. I think it's in Sweden, someplace like that. I, I have to go back and look at my own notes. Trains were a big, big thing. Uh, again, not all the pictures are breathtakingly uh, beautiful, but uh, railroads were still a very, very big thing. The dominant way of uh, transportation in 1933. So they had a lot of uh, the uh, antique uh, uh, railroads got brought into uh, Chicago. Recreations in some cases, other cases, the actual old engines. But they also had the most modern streamlined engines. Uh, here we've uh, seen before, let's zoom in on this one. We see the name here, the General, same one that Beth did the talk on, uh, came to Chicago. This is the one from the Civil War fame, uh, the, the famous great locomotive chase down below, uh, talking about a good thrill movie was used in. Uh, when I restore it, I'll take out all these snares and scratches and everything, but the General has made a habit of going to several World's Fairs and uh, being on exhibit. Show going on in the federal court, it's the court of the states. So you had all sorts of displays going on here. If we look at some of these names, Pabst Blue Ribbon uh, over here. Again, beer, come in and have a good time. And over here, you can see this uh, the something spectacular. Basically, it was their version of the Wrigley's, uh, believe it or not, freak show and uh, weird exhibit. Looking down from one of the uh, towers here, all sorts of gardens out here. Wayne uh, is trying to help me identify it. There's a, a picture I posted on uh, the World's Fair community group of a fountain, which is a giant set of toadstools on top of it. It's out here in the garden, but we've not found a name to the, uh, the fountain yet. Again, the other tower on the other side looking out across the, uh, the, the lake. Oops, okay. Uh, 1934, they added large fountains out here to the center of the fair, uh, down to the lagoon. And they put a lot of money. They spent, uh, I think it was 20 or $50 million to, to make additions to the uh, 34 season of the fair to, uh, to try to get more people to come in. And they built a large fountain out here. And I think we're gonna see some pictures of it in, uh, in operation. Just tooling around the grounds. So again, I always, I, I have a habit, I end up taking pictures about a five degree tilt every time I take a picture. This person puts me to shame. They, they, they were going for much more than five. But the Adelaide Planetarium is a huge uh, uh, thing in terms of history of planetariums, having one of the very early uh, uh, display systems to recreate the star movements and that sort of thing. So it's been expanded, uh, modernized, but it's still out there today. The uh, Field Museum, another uh, very important part of uh, Chicago culture. Uh, I don't know if anybody can identify for us exactly what type of cars there are. There are people I'm sure that can tell us exactly how many cylinders they were in horsepower. The Shed Aquarium, uh, again, this is outside the entrance of the fair. So if you were here, you would come to the fair, get dropped off at the circle outside. You could get a World's Fair map, and then you could walk up the steps that these ladies are on to go into the fair. She's up at the top of the tower, uh, one of these Skyway towers, not looking uh, very comfortable up there. I always wondered if those towers moved very much in the wind, but uh, she's way up at the, the, the top. And down below, uh, this is at the uh, uh, 
the uh, the area they did uh, stunt car races, the Jimmy Oldfield drivers. The picture was labeled the Jinx race, and I have not been able to find out exactly what this was. Uh, I'm trying to go through all Chicago newspapers, but it appears that they brought in antique cars. You can all see that they have numbers on them, and they're driving around. Again, you can see uh, Barney Oldfield. They did stunt uh, driving out here. So if anybody happens to know more about old cars or events in Chicago, uh, I, you know, again, I can track down whatever day this is, 1934. But uh, I get a real kick if, uh, that they really went all out, that they're wearing the, uh, the, the bonnets and the caps and everything that would have been uh, you know, particularly uh, appropriate to the point in time. Uh, close up of uh, the Chrysler uh, Pavilion. Uh, one of the light towers that lit it up at night. Just general view of the grounds. They're not all spectacular pictures, but they're all great captures of 90 years ago that we're never going to see again. The fountain is fired up here. You can see out one of those towers that I mentioned in the earlier picture. And uh, they uh, launched fireworks from out here. Uh, it was a uh, huge jets of water going out. These boats, again, were available for rental. If you had a party coming out and you wanted to go and see the fair uh, from the uh, grounds, and they were particularly uh, popular to rent at night because they could bring you out to the lagoon. You get an absolutely spectacular view of the fair at night and the fireworks show, uh, serve some cocktails on board, and then, uh, you know, entertain people. Background Sears, you know, again, how the mighty have fallen. Sears had a huge presence at the fair, being headquartered there in Chicago. Uh, over here in the Sears uh, building, uh, you had a lot of the uh, things like the first aid and the lost and found. They provided a, a real uh, rock bed for uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure of the fair. Off to the side here, the state of Illinois, huge uh, pavilion. More of the transportation. And again, we mentioned that people would do all sorts of performances at their particular villages. So uh, we have uh, native dancers out here in costume. Some of these were done every day of the season. Others were done just for national days that uh, they brought community groups in. As I mentioned on other fairs, if it's Lithuania Day, all the Lithuanians would come out and perform and their families would come out and watch them perform. Here's Mount Vernon, uh, one of the additions that I had a uh, uh, mental lapse on. But uh, you can come out here and you could uh, uh, tour Mount Vernon. We zoom in here, you can see somebody in continental costume outside convincing you to come inside, town crier sort of thing. Restaurant off to the side, you get Yankee pot roast and all sorts of other uh, delicacies. Irish Village, very, very popular inside. Again, all these were pretty much with giant walls. And if you wanted to see what was inside, you step through the gate for a quarter. But uh, I've got some really nice shots of them doing uh, uh, line dancing, clog dancing, and other things inside. Um, a lot of the structures, again, mentioned design, built overseas, brought over here, staffed by people from the actual uh, areas. But the popularity of the Belgian village in 33. There were all sorts of villages for 34 and people came in droves. And that's what made the 34 season a, a popular, uh, popular enough that it turned, uh, turned a profit. So we have uh, old uh, Switzerland village here, fake snow. They're gonna be doing ice skating out forest down below the Black Forest. Tower here, and, uh, advertisements for the Spanish village to go in and see all that. Here's the fountain. Again, this was all new and added for 1934. So uh, the, the Fair Corporation spent a lot of money to try to convince people that if you've seen it before, you haven't seen it, come back and see, see what you liked before and see what you didn't see before because it's all new and all better. Goodyear, as I mentioned, it's the two blimps out there. Uh, you go for a blimp ride around uh, the uh, ground. Uh, I don't know if they uh, sold it to the general public or if these are just for Goodyear dealers, like rides in the blimp were pretty much uh, today. But uh, there's some really great shots of the blimps uh, uh, tooling around the grounds. Occasionally, the photographers will pick up other parts of uh, Chicago, some of the fountains and buildings. 
And that would be it for that. How are we doing time-wise? I think I can go and grab one more thing of pictures here real quick. Let me go here. PC pictures. And let's see. Oh, this is another batch from 34. So let's take, actually, that's not such a great batch. I'm trying to figure out where I can get some better ones. Okay, uh, we're going to go, uh, I think this is still 33. So again, a lot of these statues, some of them did survive, uh, pretty much the metal ones, the plaster ones have not. This is a, a piece of, uh, by a fellow named John Storrs, uh, uh, Knowledge Combating Ignorance. So the serpents down below, that's ignorance, and but uh, if we're smart and we uh, uh, you know, think things through, we'll be able to survive the evil serpent. This is just a piece of uh, ornamental architecture outside of one of the buildings, uh, the agricultural area. So we can see the uh, man with his steer and up uh, above the uh, people. Uh, the steer, unfortunately, I think is gonna be going to, to the people, but uh, just a, a lot of the real great kind of art deco art, artwork that was out there. Again, this is over in the uh, uh, agricultural area. Off to the side, they had uh, big gardens. Florida had a big uh, floral display, palm trees, that sort of thing. Down below, you can see there were multiple rat scalers. Uh, this was a Midway Arcade. Uh, some of these areas where the things that were not so successful torn out for the, uh, the 34 season. But all this artwork done, sadly lost when the fair was torn down. Street lights, modern street lights. In the background, we can see up here uh, the part of the uh, giant cash register uh, for NCR. Now, this was done during the previews of the fair. Again, you could walk in and take pictures. This mural was up here uh, showing how the tree of knowledge, and if you, you zoom in on it, you can get some of the, the details of it. So we can see that mechanical engineering, architectural engineering, all these wonderful things, medicine, are all a part of the tree of knowledge. So this had been painted on the building and was uh, available to come in and look around before the uh, fair actually opened up. This is over at the uh, Federal Pavilion. Again, all these carved uh, uh, displays, uh, plaster carved in here. This is at the electrical group. They had light on one side, power on the other. Another view here. Uh, what, sometimes there's multiples because what I do is I scan them on the scanner with uh, dust removal on or off to see if it helps. Sometimes it helps, but sometimes it also uh, destroys the, uh, the uh, pictures. Does anybody want to see more pictures or are we done? More. More? Okay. Chicago is definitely, definitely more. That's more. Great. A little more. Okay, so hang on. Chicago is a great fair. I, I tell you, they really had a, uh, here, the, these are all restored. So again, you can get a very nice uh, photo book of uh, Chicago, um, and I took them apart. So uh, a number of these pictures are ones I did use in the book. There's not all, these are newly restored, but this is a, a great view if you came in. There's the Illinois Pavilion off here to the, the center. Uh, big thing about Lincoln inside. The Lincoln had a whole major section of the fair of uh, uh, Lincoln Village. Down here, you can see Czechoslovakia, big native <coughs> population in the Chicago area, uh, helped fund the pavilion. Looking down at the Avenue of the Flags. Here again, internet, the Illinois Pavilion. In the background, Soldier Field, that had been built uh, before the fair. So, uh, Soldier Field still out there today, so they had to kind of curve the fair around Soldier Field, uh, and we can get some very nice views from the towers down into it. Sears, big, big, big presence in Chicago uh, in 1933. Boats going across the uh, uh, lagoon. They put all these uh, bleachers out here, and they would do uh, periodic shows out here uh, that turned out not to be as popular as they thought. They, they were doing water skis and something like that. And I don't think water skiing was particularly big in 1933, but they did water uh, uh, boat races out here. Um, and uh, 
I don't think that people like sitting out here and watching them because uh, after a while, the, the, it's very rare that you actually see a lot of people sitting out here in, in the bleachers. And if I look at the calendars, it looked like the races uh, dropped off. So again, looking out at the uh, museum, and if we zoom in here, we can see that there is a big air race coming to town, the nation's greatest air meet. Uh, you could buy your tickets now, save 25%. Outside the fairground, you could buy all sorts of souvenirs, cameras, film, and everything. And these guys were very uh, big entrepreneurs because they didn't have to pay any percentage of it to the, uh, the fair uh, corporation folks. And again, just all sorts of vintage cars and things going around. Federal Pavilion across and at the Federal Pavilion. I'm just hopping around the grounds, things that are familiar. This is kind of neat. They had a kid's train that would go around here. So this is the Enchanted Island and this is the Enchanted Railway, a little miniature steam train that would take you riding around. This is kind of neat. You have all the different people that worked in the villages and they would have to get, you know, to and from work or they would uh, be going out for lunch. And if you worked in the uh, Belgian village, you probably got tired of eating Belgian waffles all day. So you would go someplace else. But lots of pictures of the fairgrounds of just people in the different costumes just uh, walking through the facility. We saw before uh, the Tower of the Pass, Paps Blue Ribbon Casino. Here's a view inside. Looking down uh, from the uh, uh, tower, you get the electrical group uh, out here and up here, the horticultural group. Again, lots of empty bleachers. Now this is kind of interesting. This area here was uh, 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 one of those things you got to start scratching your head. This whole empty area here, and I emphasize the word empty. This was a beach, uh, the Jansen Beach that you could come in they had lockers, you could take your clothes, put them in a the locker, jump into your bathing suit, go swimming in the beach. So now you have to say, why would anybody think you would do that? Why would you pay the admission fare to come out to the beach, to go to the fair, pay a fee to charge, uh, put your clothes in a locker, to go for a swim in the lake, when the lake was a giant ass lake, that's one of the reasons I call it the Great Lake, and you could go to that many beaches on it and go swimming for no charge. So the Jansen Beach was not a success uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And almost this entire area was torn out and re uh, re um, replaced by villages during the 34 season of the, uh, the fair. But if you do zoom in on it, you can see that they had a, uh, a roller coaster out here, uh, other displays, uh, a recreation of Solomon's Temple, uh, nothing out here was uh, particularly very, very popular. So um, not a big surprise it was gone for the, uh, the next season. And again, view the skyline. Uh, back when people would paint all these big signs in the sides of buildings, we can see Coke display down here and other things for Visitor Service Bureau. This is up at the top of the Skyway Tower looking down at the Soldier Field. So uh, quite, quite a drop down below. The Soldier Field, very popular, used for a number of uh, activities during the fair. Just like Shea Stadium was not really an official part of the 64 World's Fair, but was used for different events. Soldier's Field was used for different events and uh, 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 things that brought people into the fair. Nice view from one of the towers uh, over here. Again, we happen to look down and see uh, the state of, uh, well, this is, uh, no, it's, this is the science pavilion, okay. What they did for each of these uh, buildings, so they built them an equal size here. And these were ones where you could rent out space. So if we think in the 64 fair, uh, things like the uh, Better Living Pavilion or some others, again, you don't have the money to build your own building. We'll come in and we'll rent you space uh, out in here. So uh, you had a river boat out here with uh, entertainment on board. Time Life magazine, you can see covers of the magazines out here, uh, all sorts of different uh, displays as, as you went through it. Well, here's the, the fellow that I, I got the kick. Uh, he's up at the top. You can see uh, uh, sky ride visibility, so many miles, four states can be seen. 
And on the back, this is the one he's written as close to heaven as I'm likely to get. Italy, super popular pavilion. Um, there was a lot of admiration at that point for Mussolini because he was able to get the trains to run on time in Italy. Uh, people did not know what was coming for the days of World War II and some of the uh, other odds and ends. But uh, Chicago had and still has a large uh, Italian American population. So uh, this was a very popular pavilion. Another view of the shed aquarium. Uh, some things change over time, but Baby Ruth candy bars, I believe, are still with us. And there was a enterprise enterprising fellow here selling them. Italian restaurant, uh, again, big Italian American community, so uh, they're very happy to build a restaurant here. Chinese cafe. Time Magazine, these were not actual covers. If you go in and you try to figure out what issue that was or the issue of Fortune Magazine, they didn't match to anyone. And that way they didn't have to change them periodically. But down below, you can go and buy any, <coughs> any of the books or magazines that the publishing company went uh, and offered, and they would be happy to sell you a subscription. Down below, we have a Chinese theater and the, the temple over to the right. Okay, Chrysler. Down below, this bus lane would take people around uh, to from the parking lots and tours of the ground. This was the Christian Science Pavilion. They've been at many, many World's Fairs. Uh, uh, I'm not sure which was the first one, but uh, uh, they, I've got pictures of them at quite a few. More of the Haveline Thermometer. The transportation pavilion down here, and off to the side here is a poultry farm, and they had hundreds and hundreds of chickens that would uh, be raised in different types of conditions, and they would show you if we fed them this particular feed, they uh, grow to this size, and this particular feed, they grow to that size. The trouble, as uh, some of the newspaper articles mention, is hundreds and hundreds of chickens makes quite an odor. So uh, you can go in and tour the chicken coops. But uh, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people spend a lot of time at the chicken coops. Now, this is an interesting house. They built several different houses here uh, at the fair. Uh, this was done by Corning's Owen Corning Glass Company. It was all built out of glass blocks. Their whole idea was glass is a wonderful insulating item that it will keep your house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And uh, you can build an entire house out of glass blocks. A number of the houses were taken apart after the fair ended, put on barges, moved across the lake and are at a uh, state park today. I don't think the glass block house was one of them. General Motors, again, huge presence. You can see how popular the fair got here. There's the glass block house again off to the, the left hand side. This whole area here was called the home planning group. He had a uh, house with an airplane hangar built into it. So he had the glass house, a steel house, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, they were also very big on telling you how good asbestos was and you should use as much of it as, popular, as possible. This is the Mayan temple, huge uh, recreation of it. I mentioned they had, been, uh, this was a cast taken off an actual temple. Uh, they only got to build about 20% of it because the money just wasn't there to do the whole thing. But uh, for most of us, we've never been down to see a real Mayan temple to be able to go and, you know, get on the L, take it out to the fair, go and see Mayan temple, and then go home at night was a huge draw. This is out at the Enchanted Island, uh, Kitty Amusement Park area. Very, very tall gentleman who was a greeter out there. Here I mentioned the Indians lived in teepees. Again, the sort of thing you would hopefully not see in a fair today, but uh, different tribes came in, lived here, uh, did uh, you know dances, uh, you know different shows, and then the trading post here uh, to sell the wares. This was a gondola for uh, uh, not the uh, going for the sky ride, but this would take you down into the ocean and. Uh, Again, you can see the tree of knowledge that we saw before. The building now has the displays in it. And this got down to some very, very uh, great depth and uh, basically some viewports that you could look out of the hatch going in and out of. Uh, but uh, people real daring to be lowered down in the ocean and that thing. 
more of the hall here, again, with the exhibits open. Very, very hard, as you can imagine, uh, particularly for an amateur to get uh, interior pictures of the light uh, of the time. But if we Bill? Look Bill? Yeah. Um, that globe is um, mounted over a display of the uh, chemical elements. No, the Earth globe. Oh, this one, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, and that whole uh, thing was uh, uh, moved to the Museum of Science and Industry and stood in the center rotunda for decades. Do you know if they still have it? Uh, no, it's uh, it was taken out of a couple of decades ago. Well, if they took it out, that they didn't destroy it, that it's still there, you know, for, you know, potential reuse. Yeah. Thanks, Wayne. You can see, uh, again, they had all sorts of things here, names of famous scientists. So, so and there's the gondola in the background that the uh, card went down in. Well-dressed women. One of the blimps going overhead. This is the Elks Memorial downtown Chicago. As I mentioned, occasionally they uh, uh, got views outside. For those of us who like antique sort of things, you can see the, uh, the buses of Chicago of 1933. Very uh, different sort of design than you'd find today. And look at all the old antique ads at the, uh, this is the Diversity Avenue Elevated Station. But when we zoom in here, some of these brands, it's interesting to see which ones are still with us. You know, I mean, uh, I think they still make Rich Hair Dye, uh, Delmonic Coffee still around, Butterfinger and Candy Bars. So a number of them did uh, really well. Down below here, White Owl Cigars. Poster out here, how White Owl had a display at the, uh, the uh, World's Fair. And, uh, I don't know, if, uh, Wayne, if you're in the area, uh, you were in the area, is goldenrod ice cream still a thing? Well, you could have had a V8. I don't know if it still is, but I believe it was when I was a kid in the 50s. Okay. And you could go see uh, vaudeville shows and stage reviews and all sorts of things that have changed. This was the Wonder Bakery. Unfortunately, it's blurred, but uh, the you know, Telling of the Wonders of Wonder Bread. And it did rain there from time to time. Inside the uh, Westinghouse exhibit, again, unfortunately, these things do get blurry if you don't use a, uh, a tripod, but Westinghouse had all sorts of displays of generators, dynamos, regulators, all sorts of electric things. I think we'll end now so we don't wear everybody out and uh, see if I uh, go through the chat here. Rit only makes fabric dyes and dye removers. I knew Rit was still around, but uh, you can obviously see that their ad was to re replace gray hair. I've not not tried to try that particular product. Bill, my my mother used to use Rit dye remover all the time when she would throw like you know something red in with my underwear, and I had pink underwear, so she'd get uh, Rit dye remover and return it to white. Oh, that's great. That's good to know. Just looking down through the, uh, the slides here, uh, the comments here. All right, I got the date wrong. I misspoke on World Columbia. Okay. Grandpa snuck in the uh, Century of Progress by climbing over one of those fences. Aha! Uh -huh. All right, Derek, the, uh, I guess we'll let you go with the uh, statute of limitations are probably up, so. Yes, the ladies have linked arms. Safety in numbers, right? Uh, Randy said the brontosaurus looks like a cellulite really bad. <laughs> yeah, you, you just, you know, it's interesting to think that was the best they could do in 33 for whatever reason, but it does look uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty bad. Now, Derek said he thinks the uh, fair was the last one to turn a profit. That's really a, a, a big, interesting thing. 
some fairs have turned a profit, uh, you know, uh, of like a dollar ninety eight. You know, uh, I, you know, you like I, I think Hemisphere or some of the others have come up with a profit, you know, because they wanted to turn a profit. Where you say, uh, okay, you know, uh, because the state wrote off this amount of money, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the investors did this or that. So uh, this one made a healthy uh, profit. Seattle made a profit too. Um, but uh, th this one did it really well, but a, a lot of it's real creative accounting. Hey, Brock, I see you have your hand up as I'm reading through these. Yeah, just a couple of questions. Uh, one, did you actually ever show, I, I may have, I had to step away for a moment, the Ford Pavilion from 34? I don't think I did. Uh, okay. Hang on one second. I can go and uh, uh, look here real fast. Yeah, I definitely didn't turn up because I was watching for it. <laughs> yeah. The other question was, and just a general question, do you know if anybody's ever tried to colorize any of the Chicago Fair pictures from this era? Yeah, there's actually, I've done it to, to play around. Let me grab uh, some of these Ford uh, pictures as we're chatting. Okay. There are some really neat um, uh, colorizing uh, tools that you can get out there on uh, the internet. And I have played around. Uh, here, uh, here's the major Ford Rotunda. Uh, yeah. So this, yeah, this is the uh, one that was uh, taken back to uh, uh, Dearborn and unfortunately burned down. But this was a 34 edition. Uh, I have played with it and I've had mixed results uh, uh, with it. Sometimes um, I think the sky really throws these things off sometimes, um, you know, that, um, you know, whether it was the smog or the, the whatever. But um, the, I, I can play with it more sometimes. Maybe I'll do a, a day of colorization out there. There is the, colorization, uh, the colorization neural filter in Photoshop is actually pretty good. I've been doing well with it. Have you? There's a yeah. program I use called Deoldify, and uh, it's it's really kind of a neat open source uh, program that somebody did that you uh, deoldify your pictures and make them look modern. So, yeah, Bill, I I belong to a Facebook group about the uh, the Normandy, the ship, the Normandy. Mm -hmm. And there's a guy in there that does colorization that is amazing. I don't know what he uses, but it's almost hard to tell. You know, that's not a Kodachrome shot. Yeah, right. I was just I was thinking it would be interesting to see what color was actually used at the fair, you know, which you can't really pick up from the, the black and white photos, obviously, but uh, just Plus out of curiosity. Color. If you colorize it and you're just taking a guess at it, you're going to end up with, you know, a guesstimate. In some cases, you've got the color uh, color postcards in that, and you're hoping that they reproduced, you know, what the actual uh, things were. But, uh, you know, uh, if I colorize yeah. it on the computer, it's just going to come out Bill's attempt at, you know, at that. No, I realize I realize that. I just thought maybe there was somebody who was had, had some kind of information about what a certain color probably was and therefore from that he can guess on the shades of gray what's going on yeah and some of the guidebooks and some of the newspaper articles they do mention about the brilliant gold facade of the so and such or the mixture of the red and the blues that were used on so and such <clears throat> excuse me so there are some written uh, records of what some of the colors were that uh, we could use to uh, um, you know try to uh, recreate it there are a few minutes of color movies made with an old uh, color process that you can find on YouTube. And uh, for example, that avenue of flags, the flags were red. Yeah, you mentioned that. And, uh, yeah, I think they use like do fake color or, or some process like that to, uh, to, to get it. Um, no, the, the, the footage that's on YouTube was made with real color film. It uh, uh, was a lenticular process that Kodak named Kodacolor at the time, but it, it's not the same as the later Kodacolor prints, but it is true color. Oh, okay. Uh, Glenn would like to see more of the uh, vintage fun zones, rides, carnival. It's all in the book. You got to buy the book, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Uh, it's actually it, it, interesting because a lot of that stuff was there in '33, and then they tore it down to put the villages in in '34. So um, 
but they had like a, a double Ferris wheel. And that was a big thing that, you know, one Ferris wheel went one way and the other one went the other way that the idea of two Ferris wheels side by side was really uh, spectacular. And then they could change direction. They could go into both of the same reverse that they had all sorts of different odds and ends. So uh, just looking through here, um, as different folks. Uh, there were three multiple stories and that was glass enclosed, the uh, Chrysler building. So um, uh, basically it was uh, all enclosed and, and a lot of these places were really big in the fact they had uh, early air conditioning and stuff. So come on inside. So uh, Janssen Beach, any relation to Janssen Swimwear, both from Portland. I tell you, I, I was tired of eating back to Belgian waffles, sacrilege. <laughs> More amusement zone pictures. Yeah, I do. I, you know, the trouble is I have to uh, figure out where I've got them scattered around. I, I have tons and tons of pictures from Chicago. I mean, thousands of them, but I need to get around to restoring them and they're all scattered on my hard drive. And that's why you see a lot of them just say, scan 001, scan 002. And even if I've restored them and I haven't titled them, it's just going back and finding them is, uh, is on the tough side, so. But the amusement area was it was popular, um, you know, certain parts of it. Uh, but like I said, the beach, I cannot imagine. There's always some exhibit at some World's Fair you have to figure out how did anybody think that this was going to be a big, big exhibit, you know? Um, you know, but um, the beach, I don't know. It, 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 like 64, I mean, uh, I'm sure there were exhibits there that you look at and go, what were they thinking? Why would anybody come and pay and see this? or you know, uh, it's just hard, hard for me to imagine what people really got into. Oh, uh, Link on the Jinx race. Okay, let me see what they have here. Yeah, actually, there's a little bit of detail about where it came from and the fact that it was done to promote the, uh, I think it was the press exhibit there. Yeah, I'll have to read this in detail. Thank you for the link. I appreciate it. No problem. I'll send it to you uh, via private message. You don't have to copy it out of the conversation. Great, thank you. And then, uh, oh, Randy, if you get a chance, send me the link for the uh, Normandy group. And uh, I, I, I'm always fascinated by the Normandy. But I mentioned in a prior talk that my grandfather worked on the post mortem for what went wrong with the, the Normandy sinking. Oh, so he was responsible, huh? No, no, no. My, my grandfather uh, was a New York City fireman for years and years, and he ended up for a while in. Uh, basically their uh, post-mortem group, and what did they do right, and what did they do wrong? Uh, and uh, he, uh, he he wrote reports on like when the B-25 hit the uh, Empire State Building, you know, what, what how could the fire department response could have been done better. But he, and I, I wish we had it at home and it's been lost as the family has moved over the years. He did a tremendous report on the Normandy on how uh, they didn't have any unified central command for the fire department. So every fire truck was doing what they thought was the right thing. Every fire boat thought was doing what they thought was the right thing. And nobody was in charge of telling them that you're putting too much water into this thing and it's starting to capsize. So uh, he had a tremendous set of pictures of the, the Normandy, the fire on, underway, uh, you know, the wreckage lying on its side. But uh, one of his recommendations was that at every fire a major event, you have to have the uniform chain of uh, uh, command post, one person, El Jefe, that it stops there. Because uh, everybody was trying to do their damn best to save the boat, and everybody's best of intention doomed it and sank it. So uh, he was very proud of the fact that uh, that recommendation uh, for his team got implemented. And uh, that there was the, uh, the issue that they had found in doing was that sometimes a chief would come up and tell somebody to go do something and another chief would come and tell him to do something else. So who was the guy that was in charge? And uh, so he, he talked about the Normandy a lot. He had gone out and walked on this, this, you know, the wreckage and examined it. And he was very proud of the report he wrote on that. So he, uh, he was also uh, at one of the big fires in uh, uh, Coney Island from one of the, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Luna Park or one of the others caught fire and burned down. And he was mentioning the, all the newspapers because the giant uh, uh, roller coaster collapsed on the truck with him and his men and put them all in the hospital. They, they were kind of badly burned on it. But uh, he was given a department award for uh, 
show, as the thing was coming down, getting his men to safety and protecting as many of them as possible. So very, very proud of him being, uh, uh, he, he, like I say, he was a New York City battalion chief. He, he, and as a kid, it was great. I could go to the firehouse. They had a Dalmatian dog at the firehouse, like typical fire thing. And I could ride around the chief's car and they would set the siren off for me. And uh, it was it was pretty fun going up and down the fire pole. So I just wish I had more of this fire stuff. I have to see if my cousins in, uh, in Tennessee still have that stuff. You know, I'll have to reach out. So any other thoughts on the Chicago Fair? Um, yeah, uh, Bill, I had a question. I put it in the chat. Just the Chrysler building was huge. Was it multiple levels with displays on all levels, or was it just a big empty building? Or I mean, yeah, was it was. They had all sorts of displays inside. Uh, basically, one of every car that they made, and not only one. Sometimes they had multiple versions because they would like you know to offer you could get this interior with the cloth, or you could get this one with the leather and slide yourself into it. So the whole big glass area up in front of the pavilion uh, was basically a, a giant dealer showroom where they could actually take an order for a car and uh, deliver it to your house. They also had displays inside of how they uh, manufactured the equipment and uh, uh, designed the equipment, uh, you know, for prototype cars, things along that line. So it uh, pretty much. I don't think the highest level had anything in it, but sometimes these things were built just for show and looks. Uh, but uh, it was uh, three levels of, uh, of automotive uh, wonders out there. Uh, very, very well received pavilion from uh, you know vintage newspaper articles. Yeah, it's it's interesting, Bill. That the I, we just I just watched a replay of on the History Channel. I think it was of the uh, cars that build America series. I think it was. But the you know you're saying Chrysler had a huge presence there with GM or kind of opposing GM and Chrysler used to work for GM and set up his own just like the Dodge brothers worked for Ford and then set up their own company which later became part of Chrysler so it's kind of interesting all that interplay that went on that you see these names associated with one company and then they go off and start their own company and then you know at the World's Fair they're trying to compete at a level saying hey I'm the best one that's why I left GM or whatever yeah, sort of like uh, how Bioworks going and owning his own animation studio, right? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, I mean, the cars back then, uh, you know, it's, it's actually interesting. You know, uh, people all talk about cars today made out of plastic and everything. And cars back then were built like real cars. And I, I mentioned on the, the pictures I post on the uh, Facebook while well, the accidents I go to for the LAPD that, you know, the cars back then would have killed you. You know, you get an accident, you know, all that stuff. The steel just transmits the impact into you, uh, as opposed to today with airbags and ruffle zones and everything. But uh, you know, it, it is interesting to see back in the, those old days how you could get, you know, like Henry Ford, you get any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, you look at pictures of the uh, the, the uh, parking lot for the World's Fair, uh, you know, close-up pictures. I don't know how anybody found a car at the end of the day when I mean, they all. The, the, you know, there were, you know, you might have a Buick, you might have a LaSalle, you might have a Dodge or whatever, but they were all black and they all look pretty much the same. But that, that must have been an interesting show. I'll have to look for it on the line. Yeah, it was, it was a very good series. Uh, it went over three or four or five nights, I think. Um, and they just rebroadcast re it. Um, they may be still doing it. I mean, as far as they, they go back and do some of their old shows and if you, sometimes it's at two o'clock in the morning and other times it's at normal time, but. It was very interesting. That's, that's great. Yeah, back, I mean, things have changed so much, you know, with chain-driven trucks and, you know, all the different changes in technology. I mean, back then, you know, everybody had to learn how to drive a stick shift, you know, and an automatic transmission wasn't even dreamed of probably in 1933. Yeah. So, you know, and the Jinx race, it looked like there were steam, you know, Stanley steamers and other things out there. So cars have, cars have changed so much. So, uh, hey, Bill. Yes. I'm not sure if you cover this in your book. I have a, a book that I bought years ago called Unbuilt America. And it takes projects you know, that were planned and, and never built. Some of them are really fanciful stuff that, you know, why anybody ever thought they would, would anybody would want to build it. But they have a section on uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was initially had a lot of proposals for Century of Progress. 
very impressive, but he was not popular with the board. I, I think if anybody's seen any, uh, read any books, seen anything on PBS about him, he was apparently very difficult to work with. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, to, to, yeah, exactly. I know Don's laughing. That's, uh, yeah, I'm candy coating it there, yeah. Yeah, uh, just a bit. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they, right. um, Everything yeah, I've heard they of were them. really, really neat plans. It was a sub, uh, submerged restaurant uh, that went across that lagoon. Uh, a lot of really neat things, but they just said, hey, we, we don't want to work with you. Plus, a lot of them will probably would have cost you know, an absolute fortune. Hey, let me share a picture here one second. This is the uh, planned theme tower that they were going to do, and there was supposed to be an underwater restaurant down at the bottom of it. So, uh, you know, th this is going to be the huge edifice. Uh, I forget, I have uh, notes on how tall this thing was supposed to be, but you can see the people down below to give us some sort of scale. And uh, it was going to be all hollow inside, uh, you know, like I said, an underwater restaurant, all sorts of things. And uh, they built a scale model of it and then just decided there was no way that they could afford to, to do it. So uh, in, in some of the pictures, and I, I do have, uh, again, uh, in the book, a shameless plug of uh, unbuilt amusement ride that was in there. They had a, uh, I think I have a picture of it here. Hang on. I know I have a picture of it here. Let me just see if I can find it real quick. Uh, let me find it real quick. Kind of interesting ride that they were thinking of. I'm just looking through my pictures here. Where did it go? No, I'm, I'm flipping through here real quick, trying to find it. Yeah, it was, uh, again, some of these things look really great on paper. And when you put them all together, uh, it sounds really great until you, uh, you know, have to go and spend the money on it. So, oh, here, I, I, let me just flip up another picture. As I'm looking for it, let me just get this one here. Uh, share screen. I mentioned the seaplane base. Uh, this is a uh, set of the planes you could go on. You could fly uh, around the fair, go off and do it. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, they had a fatal crash on one of them and that kind of put a uh, stop to, uh, to the end of that. But uh, in the background, you can see train cars come up because you could take your private train. You could uh, have it parked out here at the fairgrounds and uh, go if you had your own uh, Pullman car, you could park out there. Here's the, uh, the uh, the seaplane base. Let me just continue to look. Here, here, uh, let me get this one for Glenn in a second. Come on, share screen. Sometimes the computer wants to find you. So here, Glenn, you wanted amusement. So you could go uh, and take the go to the great beyond and take a trip between hell and heaven. So <laughs> all sorts of uh, various uh, you know things that they had at the amusement area. Yeah, that looks great. More. <laughs> okay, I, I got lots of trains here. Uh, hang on. Uh, and I buy the book without that page now that I've seen it. <laughs> I'll sell you just that page if you want. Come on, I gotta find. I, I somewhere I must have this uh, amusement ride. I remember doing something. Bill, is your Bill, Bill, while you're looking, I'll just let you know that uh, uh, Cars That Build America was three episodes, two hours each, and I think you can stream at whatever platform the History Channel's on. I don't remember which one it is. I'll have to look for it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, again, as long as I'm just flipping through ones that might be of interest, let me grab this one. This would be uh, what you'd see out in the uh, uh, taking the tour. The buildings are built, but the exhibits are not in. And up in this uh, niche up here, eventually you would see the tree of uh, science or life, whatever they called it, going in up here. 
So uh, for the most part, they would let people come in, walk up to the area here. This guy was able to get up to one of the balconies, which uh, later time we're going to see all the other displays. But the big thing that Wayne had uh, mentioned, the uh, globe and all the elements would be down here, the bathosphere, that sort of stuff. So let me go back to my hunt. Yeah, I got this really neat picture of a, uh, a ride that the they were building. Oh, okay, here we go. We'll, he, we, we'll do this just for, for Glenn. So hang on. Here. I'm only doing this because Glenn is going to feel uh, uh, very guilty. He's going to go buy the book. <laughs> so we have the amusement area out here. You have uh, Ferris wheels off to the right. Uh, you have a mountain outside, which was full of uh, monkeys and that sort of thing. Uh, you have a uh, 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 Ferris uh, roller coaster out here in the background. But as we go through this, you can see the twin roller uh, Ferris wheels that were a big popular item. Again, uh, Ferris wheel wouldn't excite anybody today, but the thought of two of them, and uh, we're going to race the guy in the other one, and, and we're going to go frontwards. They're going to go backwards. Which way are we going to go this time? That was kind of fun. And Bill, I think you mentioned it in your book about uh, the Golden Gate Exposition. They had the twin Ferris wheel thing too. Yeah, yeah, big thing for a while. So here was the ride of the century. This was a planned ride that was uh, going to be uh, uh, you get in the gondola, would take you up uh, to the top there, and then you would slide down, slide down, slide down, go back uh, to the bottom, and you know, uh, very. Uh, very intricate design. Uh, and again, what they would do is they float these ideas uh, and then try to get investors for it. So uh, this was one of the ones that they, they tried to uh, get people to build, uh, put the money in for it. And uh, they, uh, they never did. So it's one of the, uh, I've got a number of different things over the years collected for things that were planned but never came to be. And this is uh, one that did come to be. So a matter of fact, two of them in the background so this particular one here, the idea again was you were going to go up and swing back and forth, but they ended up coming up with a ride here in the back that replaced it, which you came down and basically in a giant swivel and the cars went to rock back and forth. This one, the giant slide, the thrill of the century, this was really, really high tech. You would pay your money, you <laughs> walk up to the top, you get on a, a piece of burlap and you would slide down a wooden slide down at the bottom. <laughs> So that was the thrill of a century. So uh, yeah, it would not, still be it would still be better than rocket rods. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know what? It would also work every time. <laughs> so here's the tower dip ride again. You would you can see the cars in it. Uh, the, you know, they're not quite as elaborate as what they originally done. But they would take you up to the top and these cars would come sliding down at a high speed of rotating as they came down into the uh, uh, the base. Uh, street lights for the area, speaker systems built in. Yeah, those, those street lights are uh, very iconic of the fair and uh, I believe they were used in some of the graphics like for guidebook covers and things like that. Oh, you're right. That's where I recognize it from. Yeah. 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 Pretty neat. Like I said, loudspeakers on them. So, uh, you know, lighting, uh, you know, direct lighting and little light up, you know, little dots of lights would light up here. Go to the, and again, you can see different things here. You can see the Holland Dutch Village. You can see the streets of Shanghai, all sorts of, you know, attractions here. If we zoom in on this one, this was kind of neat. You could get a movie of yourself for 25 cents. And uh, basically they had a backdrop of pictures of the World's Fair and you could come in and uh, they would take a movie of yourself. I believe it was all in black and white, but it would have a, this thing saying, hey, I'm at the, uh, the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. So for 25 cents, you got uh, to take that home. And uh, this was another exhibit in the back. In the back, you can see uh, Coca-Cola for all of five cents. And uh, these guys are out here uh, guessing your weight. As I mentioned in the book, they uh, got into arguments uh, a lot with customers because if they uh, said that uh, if I can't guess your weight, it's free, well, then the, they would get it wrong and they'd refuse to pay the customer. And the cop out here is chatting with them. 
but they had quite a few complaints that they basically told them they didn't clean up their act and actually, you know, let people have their money back. Because they, they would, you know, basically you'd pay because they were wrong and give the money back. And then they would go out of their way not to give you your money back. So the whole file in the file cor uh, fair corporation reports on the problem they had with the, uh, the guess your weight guys. And uh, you don't want your money back. You'd really want one of these uh, miniature canes, don't you? Oh, you don't want your money back. You'd really, you know, they do everything they could to, to keep it. You could also go to a display of voodoo. Um, again, uh, you know, voodoo dolls inside and, you know, all, all, uh, exhibits of uh, uh, their dark arcane arts. I think that might be the last of the amusement ones. Yeah, then we go off. Uh, to the rest of the fair. So, Phil, yeah. someone, had, someone had asked about um, the BIE and uh, that you mentioned, uh, did they try to get recognition for 1934? Uh, if you go to the BIE website, it mentions the 1933 season, but there is no mention of 1934 season in any way, shape, or form. So yeah, they may have gone and asked for it, but were denied. Um, and the BIE has done weird things, well, many weird things over the years, as we all know from the 1964 fair. But um, a few years ago, they went back, they were formed in, I think, 1928. A few years, they went, uh, a few years ago, they went back and they decided which fairs before 1928 would have met their standards and, and now include them as a list of recognized expositions. Uh, I know uh, San Francisco 1915 was one. Uh, I'm sure Chicago, you know, 1893 was one. Uh, and, and probably every Paris exhibition would have been one. Right. Are they, Paris. Do they list either the 1940 fairs on their site? Um, no, not, uh, Golden Gate is not mentioned at all. And uh, the 39 season of New York is mentioned because it was. Yeah, but they don't mention 40, right? What's that? They don't mention 1940. No. Yeah. Because again, I don't think anybody went back because that, then they would be breaking their own rules for a multi fair season. So, but like 39 was really done with everybody knowing that 40 was coming, uh, you know, along well if, if 39 did okay. Yeah, they actually invited the 1935 Paris exhibition to reopen the next year because there have been so many issues in getting that open. The, the sand flooded, a lot of the pavilions were late in opening, there were labor strikes, imagine that in France. <laughs> um, a lot of things, you know, just caused issues for the fair opening. Of course, you know, the, they declined, you know, you know the, the Bureau offered the ability because, uh, you know, they had more important things to be concerned about at that point. You just brought back a memory when you mentioned a labor strike in France. The first time I ever went to work in France, the uh, um, track the farmers were having a, a protest about something, price of gas or, or something. They were blocking all the roads going in and out of the airport with their tractors. And uh, we were very lucky because we had landed and we were coming in to uh, going into Paris as all the tractors were going out to block all the roads. So uh, <laughs> that, that was just, you know, it set, set the tone. I forget how many strikes I was there for over the years. Uh, you could be there for one year and, and have like 12 strikes easily. It could be Air France, it could be the railroads, it could be the farmers, you know. I, I told my daughter was just in, uh, uh, on a trip, she went to Denmark and uh, took a cruise uh, out to, uh, Greenland or Iceland and, and that sort of thing. But uh, she had to fly home from Copenhagen just as SAS went on strike. So right. uh, yeah, so we had to go through hell to get her home. And you know, it, was, it brought back memories of one trip I had where I landed in Rome and they, when we landed, they announced that the baggage handlers had gone on strike and uh, they were not gonna unload the airplane. So uh, a bunch of us all decided we were gonna unload the airplane on our own. So uh, we spent about four hours digging through the suitcases. So luckily somebody knew how to run, you know, the conveyor belt to get the thing, you know, stuff down off the plane. But uh, I was ready to take the train to leave to go to some other country because there was no way I was going to get on a plane loaded by amateurs. But, 
it, it, you know, the weight balance calculations could have been a little bit off, but they, they, you know, Air, Air Italia just uh, said, okay, you want to unload it, you want to unload it. So it was, it was, man, hot and messy, and but we, we got our baggage off, and but that, that was my first trip to Rome, and I was going, oh God, this is, that was a great, great experience to the, the eternal city. Uh, on the other hand, a uh, strike of the French baggage handlers might be an advantage because it would be less likely that your bags got lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or rifled through. Yeah, do you see what Delta just had to do for Heathrow? They had so many bags that got separated from passengers in Heathrow that they flew an entire plane full of baggage, nothing but baggage, back to the United States because they couldn't yeah. get it sorted out in Heathrow. They brought it back here to sort it out in the United States and then forward it on to the uh, uh, individuals, you know, that, that had lost it. So uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that at the beginning. I actually, had, they actually have to have flight attendants on those flights, even though there are no passengers, because they actually had some a lot of suitcases in the cabin too, strapped into seats. But they have to have a, a, a certain number of flight attendants. It's well below the minimums when passengers are on there, but just to keep an eye out for fires and stuff like that that could erupt in the cabin. That's that's crazy, but uh, uh, I, I may have mentioned uh, crazy flights, but you might get a kick out of this. having worked on the airline so much, Randy. I had a, uh, I was, I went to uh, uh, school upstate New York, and I lived upstate New York, and I had uh, taken a trip down to uh, New York for Thanksgiving. Flown down on some Podunk airline from Albany, New York, down to uh, uh, New York uh, to New York City for uh, sort of Thanksgiving. And uh, had the dinner. Uh, my dad drove me out to the airport, uh, drops me off. I go to the airline counter, and the airline's closed for the weekend. And uh, I went to the next counter and said, Where are the guys from whatever Podunk Airlines? So they decided not to fly today. So now I've got a call back to my grand, no cell phone. So I call in my grandparents' house and say, You know, I'm stuck at, I, I think I was at LaGuardia, and I had to get to Kennedy or vice versa for another flight. And the only flight they could find. And my dad was a travel agent, so he fly, found me a flight from uh, uh, New York City to Buffalo, and then from Buffalo over to uh, Albany. Kind of a crazy route for those that know New York, right? So uh, he has to drive back to the airport, drive me from, pick me up at Kennedy or LaGuardia or whatever, and drive me to the other one. I get on the plane, I fly to uh, 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 Buffalo, and I walk up to the gate, and I, I, I think it was American, it might have been Mohawk Airlines, but I walked up to the gate, and I, I said, uh, uh, you know, and there's nobody at the gate. I mean, there's a, pass, a, a clerk working there, but no passengers around. I go, oh God, don't tell me they canceled this one. So I walked up and I said, excuse me, I have a reservation on the flight to uh, Albany. It's still going. And the lady says, I'll be right with you, Mr. Cotter. And I go, how the hell did she do that, right? Yeah, she, she greeted me by name. So I, I, I said, how did you know my name? She goes, you're the only one with a reservation on the flight. And, and I said, oh, no, you're not going to cancel it. Please, no, I don't want to be stuck in Buffalo. And she said, no, 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 we need the plane in Albany for the morning. So we're going to go even if it's just you. And so far, it's just you, right? So, um, and I said, okay, it's great. I think it was a 727, something like that. So I'm sitting there and uh, waiting for it. And a guy comes up and a Marine comes up and he uh, goes up to the, the counter and says, is there any way I can get on the flight to New York? And the lady says, okay, I'm gonna have to check uh, on this for you. And she goes over and talks to me and says, we wanna play a joke in this guy, we go along with it. And I go, okay. So she goes back to and tells the, the Marine, okay, Mr. Cotter has rented the entire plane, but he said, because you're in uniform and you're serving, he'll let you go on board, but he just doesn't want you to bother him on board the plane. So I get on the plane, I sit up in like row two or something like that. They make him sit all the way in the back of the plane. They, and they, they were really great. The, the pilot gets on board, Mr. Cotter, your flight to Albany would be taking off and flying at your usual preferred altitude of 22,000 feet or whatever. So we fly the entire flight to New York and they, get, they bring this guy a meal. Mr. Cotter thought you might like something to eat. We land in Albany and he comes up and as he's getting off the plane, he says, look, I know I'm not supposed to talk to you, but I'll never forget today. This is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could think was, I'm not going to tell the guy the truth because he's a Marine and I'm not. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, it was like the two of us in this entire plane with four flight attendants. And that was, 
it was the most bizarre flight I've ever had in all the millions of miles I've ever done. It was, was absolutely a crazy event. Yeah, in 43 years with the airlines, I had one or two flights where we had just one passenger. Yeah, it's the same thing. They need the airplane at the other end, so, so it goes, you know. Well, it was the only time I've ever had a private jet. I felt very, very, uh, you know, very, very special. Well, uh, this concludes, I guess, uh, number 97 of these things. I'm, I'm hoping to get to the Magic 100 soon. Uh, hopefully the virus will die down. And, uh, you know, although here in LA, as mentioned earlier, it's just getting to be insane again. The, uh, the numbers are, are just uh, booting up there. Uh, I think next week we may be looking at the knots very far in depth. Uh, I do have the talk that I want to do about Disney and mid-century architecture, and I'm not sure what else uh, is going to be there. So I'm going to be working feverishly on getting some knot stuff ready for this week, including some uh, vintage movies if I can get them restored in time. So uh, I'll announce it online uh, uh, when I confirm it, and uh, hopefully we'll... Uh, We'll all stay well and healthy, and I'm glad, Don, that you're feeling better. Well, thanks, sir. Good to be back. Bill, before you go, um, yeah. the U.S. always send you the uh, link to that Normandy. I don't know if I have your email or not. Is it available somewhere? On yeah, you can just send it to me as a Facebook messenger, and I'll, I'll get it. Okay, there. I'll do that. One. Yeah, I've, I've talked to you that way before. Oh, yeah, uh, again, if you go to, uh, you know, I just hate to put my normal email here, which sure. then ends up on Zoom. Uh, and then I, I get enough spam as it is, but uh, you can always get to me through the worldsfairphotos.com site, use the yeah. contact me thing, and it sends an email. And I get yours, but you don't get mine, so. Um, okay, and would you be interested in scans of those Frank Lloyd Wright designs for Century yeah, Park? No, I, I, or not, I, that's fine. But... Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a big fan of his stuff, so yeah, I'd love to see it. Okay, yeah, I'll try to get that done sometime. Okay. And you need, to, you need to come up. We need to meet up at the Academy for lunch one day. I know. Yeah, I know. We don't live that far apart, but in L.A. it is that far apart. <laughs> it, uh, you know, it, it, it's astonishing. I, I had a company I was selling to a bunch of people from uh, Arkansas, and they came out and they wanted to meet, you know, our major customers. And we'll do this in the morning. We'll do this. And I said, do you have any idea how long it's going to take to get from, you know, here to there? Well, it's only 30 miles. I said, you have no idea what 30 miles in LA is going to be. Oh, no, we'll do it. Well, the first day when they realized they got out here uh, coming from Little Rock, it was an entire difference. Actually, they were in the small town of Conway, Arkansas. So they came out and uh, found that, that the noon hour traffic in LA on Wilshire Boulevard is a little bit different than Main, Main Street and Conway. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I worked for Western Airlines before Delta. When Delta bought Western, the schedulers in Atlanta really had no idea what LA was about. So they'd call a reserve flight attendant who lived in, you know, San Fernando Valley and say, well, we've got a trip for you at the Orange County Airport. Could you be there in, in an hour? It's like, yeah, you send a helicopter. You know. Yeah. You know, I mean, these days I'm 17 miles from Burbank Airport. It could take me an hour to get there. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's terrible. You know, uh, we, we, uh, Two weeks, three weeks ago, I, I did a funeral, uh, unfortunately, for an LAPD officer. And we did a motorcade down from uh, our station down to the, the, uh, 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 to the cemetery. And they closed all the freeways for us, which was a really bizarre situation. You're being the only ones on the LA freeway at 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. It was really bizarre. Uh, but uh, that's the only time I'm, even with that, you'd have a hard time getting from San Fernando Valley to Long, you know, John Wayne in an hour. I mean, it's yeah. got to be 75 miles. Yeah. So, they, had, they had no clue, yeah. Yeah. Well, great. I hope, I, I know there's big heat waves and storms and everything back east. I, I hope people are doing well with the weather and survive through it. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, nobody has their houses washed away or anything like in Virginia did. So we'll uh, hopefully see you all next week. Thanks, Bill. Later. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Bye.